Nothing robs us of freedom like the pursuit of approval. That's what Paul is addressing in verse 10. And then he actually unpacks that for the rest of the book, for the rest of his letter. Galatians is unlike any of other Paul's letters in that he normally begins his letters with a lot of encouragement, but not, not Galatians. After his initial greeting in the first few verses to the Christians there, he goes off on them. He's enraged because they've abandoned the gospel of grace for a religion of rules, and he's dumbfounded by it. He had been there before, and he had preached grace to them, that grace is what connects us to God. Uh, And they were quickly, the people that initially received that in the region of Galatia were now quickly abandoning that for a religion of rules. Some seemingly credible religious teachers were telling these people that this whole grace thing is a sham, and that there are certain things they need to do in order to secure God's love and approval. They were a bunch of yes, grace, but teachers that had these people believing rules needed to be kept and rituals needed to be followed in order to be in with God. If there was ever a time for Paul's message to the people in Galatia to be resurrected, it's now. Because when you look at who he was writing to and what he was writing about and the problems that prompted him to write this letter in the first place, it sounds eerily familiar to the way things are today. Too many churches, in my opinion today, perpetuate the impression that God is primarily concerned with us being good and flying right So sermon after sermon, message after message, book after book, it's communicated that God is primarily concerned with us getting cleaner and better and flying straighter. But this misses the main point, which is that Christianity is not about good people getting better. It's good news for real people coping with their failure to be good. So... That means that the heart of the Christian faith is grace, not works. The heart of it is good news, not good behavior. And like so many today, the people in Paul's day were being misled to believe that this whole thing is about what we do for God rather than what God has done for us. So Paul goes right to the heart of the matter in verse 10. He gets right to the heart of the matter by bringing up the issue of approval. Let me read it again. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Now, let me tell you how I used to preach this passage years ago, okay? Because on the surface of things, what it looks like it's saying is, Don't be concerned about pleasing man. Be only concerned about pleasing God. Don't worry about it. I I heard this almost my entire life. Don't worry about people pleasing. Be into God pleasing, not people pleasing, as if that's supposed to unload me of my burden, okay? Um, But the truth is that Paul is warning against a double slavery here. He's warning against the slavery of living to gain the approval of others on the one hand, but also the deeper slavery of living to gain the approval of God. He's addressing both of those here. And as I said, he spends the rest of the letter articulating what a uh, foolish errand it is to try to live your life to gain God's approval. Someone once said that the deepest fear we have, the fear beneath all fears, is the fear of rejection. Someone who understood the human condition very well. In fact, they went on to say, it is the fear of rejection that fuels so much of the tension and the stress 
of everyday life, the tension you feel, the stress that we experience. So much of that is fueled by the fear of rejection. In order to feel valuable and secure, we feel like we need the approval of others. So much of our own perceived sense of worth and significance rides on what other people think. The opinions of other people matter too much to us. Nothing robs us of freedom like the pursuit of approval. 